Hello, everyone. This is Elizabeth Preston, and I'm an executive consultant with Hurley Wright. And you're listening to the Writing Docs podcast, where we talk about how businesses can help their team members to become better and more confident writers. I'm excited to have Graham Freeman on our podcast today. Graham is a prolific technology writer who has been published in Quality Magazine and has worked with Cisco Systems, Rogers Communications, and Precision Content. He is also a Senior Content Manager at Intellix Technologies, ULC. He's written on topics including quality, health and safety, environmental sustainability, and knowledge organization. He has also been praised for his extensive research abilities, clear communication, and pretty much being the ideal technical writer. Further, he has been an instructor at George Brown College and Queen's University in Canada, teaching technical communications, musicology, and music theory. Welcome to the podcast, Graham. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here. That that person you described sounds really cool. I'd like to meet him sometime. He is cool. That's why he's on the podcast. We'll see. That's great. Thank you. It, Graham, you have a master's and a PhD in musicology, and that seems like an untraditional background for a technical writer. How did you find yourself in technical writing? Uh, so, so music and writing have always been two things that I've done in tandem my entire life, and, and I've, I've never really thought about sort of choosing between them. I do music and I write about music. Uh, when it came time to go to university, I thought uh, I like writing and I, and I like music. It'd be really a good idea to put those two things together and, and write about music. And so that's what I did. And, uh, and I went through a, a bachelor's and an MA and a PhD studying um, music history and, and theory and uh, and then I think for, for a lot of reasons that a lot of academics come across, it didn't work out that that, that, that would be my career path. Um, and I shifted to something that was a little bit more in demand. And I thought about, about writing and it was actually a, uh, a colleague who turned me on to the idea of technical writing. Um, the idea of writing, uh, you know, things like instru- at, at the time we were talking about things, writing like instructional manuals and software manuals and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and it sounded really, really cool. It sounded like a great way of uh, writing about things in a very um, regimented kind of way for for people who had specific needs for the content. You know, they needed to get information out of it. They needed to uh, to learn something. Uh, and it it really it really gelled with me. And I've moved. Uh, I, I've I've done quite a lot of technical writing. I actually work in a in a marketing writing position at the moment, um, which is a, another interesting way of, of applying these ideas to a different way of writing. It is interesting where the recovering academics go, isn't it? As a recovering <laughs> academic myself. <laughs> there are a lot of us. Um, and, and uh, you know, I've, I've, I've read some of, of uh, and watched some of Pam's excellent videos and, and articles on this, and it's, it's a big group. Um, and I think that's a really interesting way of thinking about academia is, is there's none of us really go in there, I think, being completely certain what's going to come out the other end. And very rarely do, we, do they teach us about precisely what it is that's going to come out the other end. They sort of do their job. It's a bit like a manufacturing facility, right? They, they do their job, they build the car, but then once the car is done, however you drive it, and wherever you drive it is entirely up to you. And they don't really think about that. Um, but the other reality is they, you know, they, they, they put out a lot more uh, PhDs than, uh, than there is a job market to support them as teachers and researchers. And so, yes, I mean, a lot of us find interesting uh, ways to, to try and find a living um, and end up in really cool places. And, and that's what I've done. And I'm really grateful for that. We have a running joke on here, Graham, where any sort of bad writing habits we find in our clients, we go, it's college's fault. Because you're right, they do just kind of teach them to write for college. And then when we academics get out, it's like, oh, you know, our kids were not taught these vital skills. I can teach you these vital skills now that we're out in the real world. 
That's true. I mean, the only thing that I think I, I might add to that is the extent to which colleges really teach a lot of them to write at all. Uh, at least in, in my experience in teaching, um, we just kind of expect that they know how to write. Uh, and I think that's one of the other really dangerous things is thinking that because someone's been to high school uh, or they can read and write, that that naturally means they're very good at reading and writing um, because they can do it, um, which, which I think is very strange. You know, we don't, we don't assume that because people can walk and, and run that they're excellent sprinters or that they can run marathons. But I think we often assume that people can do that in colleges. Uh, and then we don't spend a lot of time teaching them about what writing actually means. We just think, well, if you know, if you know the subject um, and you've done the work and you've done the studying, then the writing will just happen. That's, that's easy. So I think it's, at least in my experience, I think it's a combination of, um, yeah, poor teaching of writing, but also just a, uh, a tacit um, laziness where, where they assume that they can write and they don't have to worry about it, uh, teaching them how to write at all. And we also tend to forget that students need to learn to write in different contexts for different audiences. It's not just one size fits all. And that was one thing I found so interesting about the writing you've done and that you currently do, Graham, because you've done so much technical writing for various fields and topics. So you've done a lot of audi different audiences in different contexts. What were some of the commonalities that you've seen in technical writing among all those different fields? The biggest, probably the biggest common feature they all have is that I didn't know anything about them when I started writing for them. Um, and I think that's really important is that, is that I'm not a subject matter expert in, in a lot of the things that I write about, or at least I didn't start off being. Uh, I needed to be able to figure out how that field works and, and figure out how I can write about it in a way that readers don't think that I don't know what I'm talking about. And, and I think that's a really important common feature is I've written about a lot of different things, both in, in various positions and as a freelancer, things that I didn't know anything about when I started writing about them, but I had to figure them out. And I think that might be one way in which my academic background has been helpful uh, is that I, I have learned how to approach researching a problem uh, and figuring out how to do things. Um, how to put together the information, how to find, how to go through huge amounts of information and then put it all together in a succinct written format. And I think that's something that, I don't know if I would say my academic background helped me with that or if that's something I've been able to extract from my academic background and sort of uh, repurpose for my own, for my own uh, purposes. I think maybe the other thing that they have in common is that all of them have, um, all of them require that the, the audience, the reader get something fairly important out of it. Um, it's not just informative, right? It's not just, um, policy writing or it's not just legs and regs or, uh, or, or something like that. This is critical information. And especially when you're working in something like health and safety, uh, quality management or compliance, the audience is 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 very much waiting <laughs> to to get that information that you have to offer them. Right, jobs can depend on it, lives can depend on it. So, and it, you know, in in uh, in technical writing, I think that's really important to remember is that the way people do their jobs relies on them knowing the information you're giving to them. And sometimes if that's a piece of equipment on a drilling rig, or if it's, if it's, you know, any, anything that people might be using, especially in the field, a lot can ride on that. Um, and that sense of responsibility, I think is really important for a lot of these things. So this, this, it's an important kind of writing where you are telling people things they definitely need to know because they need to put that into action. Um, and I really like that kind of writing. Uh, it forces me to think very carefully about what it is that I'm writing and what it is that I know and assumptions that I'm making. That's so important what you said, that this type of writing 
does something in the real world. It has an importance. There is a so what. We try to hammer at Hurley Wright that writers get the whiff them or the what's in it for me for the readers to show this is why it's important to you. This is why you need to use this information because writing is the deliverable. We kind of see a lot of people push off the writing going, oh, that's the last minute thing. Let me just bust it out. When really, as you said, this allows people to do their jobs. It allows them to stay safe. It allows them to do their jobs in a safe environment. I think that's such an important point that you made. You said at least two important things, that our writing needs to be clear, that it needs to distill all this research into kind of bite-sized chunks for people that they'll actually read and understand. Are there any other crucial elements to technical writing that you've found in your work? Yes. Um, I was thinking about this earlier and thinking about if I had to distill what some of these these important principles are, what would they be? Um, and one of them I think I've touched on already is this is this ability to figure things out when you're not an expert. Um, and it's it's very difficult today, I think, as a writer or a technical writer in any field to say, I write about this topic and just this topic. Um, the job market isn't really about that anymore. We do, as writers in particular, we often move around a lot, end up in different places, um, different jobs. And this ability to say, I don't know what I'm supposed to be talking about yet, but I know I can figure it out because I have a system for figuring it out. I think that's really important. Um, yes, there are a lot of people who write who are also subject matter experts, but I think the vast majority of us aren't. And I think if we're not, then it's a really important job skill for us to have to say that we can always figure things out. Um, it makes you more versatile. It makes you more hireable. Uh, and it makes you more resilient when you're in an industry, especially the technology industry, where there's a good chance there'll be you can be replaced um, fairly quickly by by an AI that can do your job. Um, whether or not it can do it well is is one question, but we always know that we always know that people who hold the purse strings are looking for cheaper ways to do things, and if there is a way to do it that's good enough, then then often they will. So this ability to be versatile and resilient and, and always be able to figure things out and offer value, um, I think is, is a really, a really important, really critical point for technical writing. Um, the other thing that I think is really important and has served me really, really well, and it's something that I sort of go on about a lot, especially with my students, is this idea of having a, uh, a systemic, um, a systematic, pardon me, a systematic approach to writing where you always know how to start the task. It's, it's sort of a, a system in which you know where to start. You have the, the steps that you always use with, with which to start. You pull the trigger on that system you, and the machine runs. And at the end, you get the output that you know you're going to get because you, you have a systematic way of doing it. Um, for me, that means I always know how, I, how I'm going to start my project. My project always starts with research. My research always consists of reading, taking notes. Uh, I have a very sort of developed, organized way in which I take notes. I have a system for uh, labeling the notes that I take and, and where I put them in certain places. I use a bibliography tool. Um, I use a tarot, a, an open source bibliography tool to keep track of my citations and, and understand uh, what it is that I'm doing. How very uh, academic of you. Well, it, it it is, and it's it's. I guess it's one of those things that I've probably brought over from from uh, academia is uh, is that workflow, and it's it's been really helpful. So if they didn't teach me to write, at least they they did a good job of teaching me how to to do research really well, which is is a benefit unto itself. Um, I'm I'm a very uh, very prolific planner. Uh, I do very detailed outlines typically before I write. Um, I map everything out. I have all my citations in place. I arrange all of my information, all of my notes in the way the, the, the piece is going to look when it's done. 
I probably spend 70% of my time researching, planning, and outlining so that when it comes time to writing, uh, to do the writing, most of the work is done. Uh, and then, and then the writing is, is the easiest part, I think, because by that point I have a plan. I know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm not speaking from a place of ignorance anymore. Uh, and then I put all of that together. So I'm, I'm a big planner, um, in that regard. And funnily enough, I think the last thing I would say, and it sounds, it sounds like kind of old fashioned advice and, and maybe a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit silly, but one of the things that's been really critical for me as a writer and especially in technical writing is knowledge organization. Um, even down to things like, uh, file naming conventions and, and keeping things organized. Uh, I, I think there's, there's this perspective that because we do everything in the cloud, that we share everything in the cloud. But that's that's not always true. I mean, there, we often can't share things if we're working in an organization. We can't share things externally if we're talking with customers or partners and that sort of thing. So the world of sending attachments by email uh, is still very much there. I still do that all the time, every day. And it's amazing how quickly that can interrupt the way you organize your knowledge. Um, how how it's amazing how often I see people send the wrong version uh, of things to external, you know, external customers or changes that haven't been merged or things that haven't been sent through a workflow because they just, they don't have an automated cloud-based workflow. Uh, and so things like file naming conventions and how we organize knowledge and, and how we sort of create our own information architecture ourselves um, I think is really critically important, not just um, an organizational form of information architecture, but how do we build an information architecture for ourselves that consists of how we organize information, how we access that information that we've organized, how we um, operationalize that information, how we write it. So for me, uh, the biggest, I think one of the biggest, most important things is this idea of an information architecture we build that consists of everything from how we organize our information to uh, how we access our information to how we put that information out into the world. Mm -hmm. All of that's part of clearly communicating internally and reducing those inefficiencies. There are a lot of times where our email subject lines are not efficient or our emails themselves, you know, Hi, how are you? I hope you had a good weekend. That's nice. Can I just get to what you actually want me to do? Yes. And that's something yeah. we're not necessarily trained in, uh, at least when we get out into the real world. And I want to go back to one thing. When you were talking about planning, I think that's super important to hammer on because so many people think that writing is the type of type. It's writing down on a piece of paper, but writing at least half, I think research mostly shows 80%, uh, is thinking. It's researching. It is the planning stage, or some people refer to it as pre-writing, but pre-writing really is writing. So when you cheat yourself of that stage, you're really making the later stages much more difficult, more inefficient, and time-consuming, and even frustrating, I think. I... I, I agree. Um, and I think writing is, is something in which, because we can all do it to a certain degree, and, and, and to a certain degree, I mean, really, every, most of us can, can construct a sentence, right? We were, we're all writing emails or we're all writing social media. Uh, and I think there's this idea that because it is something that we can basically do, we can basically communicate through writing, then we're all writers and we can all write and, and, you can simply do it without having to think about it. Um, it goes back to one of the pieces of, of writing advice that often bothers me the most is when people say, write like you speak. And I know that in, in a lot of cases, that's meant to be a good way of infusing your writing with your voice. But written communication and oral communication are very different. We get away with a lot more in oral communication than we do in written communication. Um, 
uh, and it's really interesting for me because this, I guess this is another place where my um, academic background helps me. Um, my PhD thesis and my postdoc were both about oral transmission um, of music in uh, my, my doctoral dissertation was about the, the oral transmission of folk music in the early 20th century. And then my postdoc was about the transmission of, of instrumental music, um, both in, in uh, oral transmission and written transmission in early modern England. And one of the things that's really interesting when you, when you dig deeply into that is how different oral transmission uh, and written transmission are and the kinds of things that you get away with. I mean, even just in, in this, this conversation, um, my, I can get away with all sorts of things that I, that I can color with the shade of my voice, with, with the way I phrase something, with the way I articulate something. I can be a lot more repetitive when I speak than I ever could um, in writing. People, when they speak, communicate enormous amounts of information through their gestures. Uh, sometimes you, you'll find that people are speaking, but the words that they're using are only half the story. The rest of what they're saying is actually in the gestures that they're using. Uh, and we, we get away with all kinds of things like that. And then when people say, write like you speak, I think we discover that writing and speaking aren't the same kind of thing at all. Uh, and they're, they're very different ways of, of communicating. And so there's this idea that um, because we can all do that, that we can all simply be good at writing. Um, but writing is, a, writing is a skill. Writing is a craft. Um, it needs an approach in a way that speaking doesn't necessarily uh, need the same kind of an approach. Writing also gets the rap that you have to be grammatically accurate, you have to be grammatically on point, which to some extent, yes, but we often hear managers say so many times that their team's problem is their grammar. And one thing that I found so interesting about you when I was researching you, because I'm a nerd too and I research, is on one of your blog posts, you say, I'm not a nerd for grammar, and I don't think it's necessary that a good writer be one. Can you explain this further for our audience, why being a good writer doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a grammar nerd? I think that one of the most important things for being a good writer is having a good ear for writing. And, and maybe this is something that goes back a little bit to, to my musical background, but I don't think it requires a musical background to have one. I think that writing is something that should sound nice. And it, not even necessarily when you're reading it out loud, but when you're, when you're looking at the page, being able to judge whether or not a sentence is nicely balanced. Where is the information that you need to provide? Um, what's the, the important part of the sentence? Do you tend to bury all of that at the, at the end of every sentence? Do you always put everything in, out front? Do you always write in really long sentences? Do you always write in really short sentences? Um, what's th what's the, the pattern of the music, of, of the, the, the sentences that you're writing? Do they always have sort of the same uh, sort of informal metrical uh, stance, that same kind of rhythm and that same kind of pulse over and over? I think it's really important to have a good ear for what you're writing. How does it sound in your mind? Um, what's the music of what you're writing? And if you have a good ear for writing, and I think this is something you can pick up by reading other people who write really, really well. I think it's part of this intrinsic connection between reading and writing. You need to be a, a, a I think you need to be a voracious reader, really, to be a, a good writer. Um, but the ability to hear that sense of music, to hear that sense of flow, even if you can't, um, even if you can't uh, sort of qualify it in the sense of, of understanding exactly what it is another writer is doing, getting that general sense, that musical flow of the writing, I think is really, really important. And I think it's more important than grammar. I think it's possible to have good writing that is that is musical, that has a, a wonderful uh, flow to it, has a wonderful sense of, of development and, um, and melody to it without it being grammatically perfect. But I also think it's possible to have writing that's grammatically perfect 
that is um, dull and uninteresting and makes people not want to read it. Even in technical writing, which which I think often gets the the rap of being um, not having a creative element to it at all, and that it should be very uh, very clean and very precise and shouldn't have any personality to it. I don't think that's entirely true. I think all writing needs to be something that we want to read as people uh, and not necessarily as as machines. Um, it's, it's interesting. I, w- when I teach my students, I've always sort of said, when I teach them editing, editing is always a funny course because um, a lot of students hate it. And they do the editing course because it's part of the class. And they think, oh, I love writing, but I hate editing. And so a lot of students hate it. And one of the things that I always used to say was, um, not all writers are good editors uh, because editing is a certain kind of skill. It needs a certain kind of objectivity. Um, so not all writers are good editors, but all editors are typically good writers because you, you sort of need to have that as a, as a stepping stone for being able to, to judge other people's writing. Um, And I always thought that was the case. And then one day, a a long time ago, I met one. I met an excellent editor who was a terrible writer. Oh, Um, no. And I'd never encountered such a thing before. I'd never encountered anybody who was so good at uh, being a mechanic for sentence structure and, and grammar and the rules and clarifying things. And then was completely incapable of writing anything even remotely engaging on their own. And I didn't think they existed. And then I found one. And it sort of just made, reminded me that um, grammar, is, grammar is important. Uh, and I would never say you shouldn't know anything about grammar at all. I know lots about grammar. Um, I don't think about it very often. And I'm not super fussy about it. But I, I do genuinely think that grammar is something that, that, that can easily be learned. Um, you can learn the rules, you can learn to apply the rules, and you can learn to, um, you can learn to uh, be a, a, a reviewer or a critic or an editor based on those rules. That's probably one of the places, I think, where AI will, will um, crowd us out, first and foremost, in writing. Is, it's probably in editing. Um, and and grammar, but I also don't think it's the most critical thing. Uh, I think the most critical thing for being a writer is having a good musical sense, a good ear for the writing, a good sense of what makes for a, a, a nice a nice narrative flow of the writing. Um, I think that's more critical than grammar. I don't think they're exclusive. I don't think you can do without both of them, but I would much rather read something from someone who has a great ear and is compelling than I would something that's grammatically proper and makes me not want to read it at all. So again, I don't, I don't think they're exclusive, but I think, I think they're both very important. But I think the, having a good ear for music is, is a, a more important prerequisite for being a good writer than is being good at grammar. AI is good at grammar, but it's not great at writing yet. Uh, and I think that's a, a useful use case for how that, that works. Yeah, AI doesn't have that flow. This flow that you're talking about is very uniquely human because we can feel it. And while it sounds almost nebulous, you know it when you see it. When you see four or five sentences, exact same length, exact same structure, but grammatically perfect, perfect you feel like, oh, I am falling asleep. I don't want to read this. I just want to do anything other than this. So all of that good research that writers do, all of the good information doesn't get paid attention to. It's almost an issue of audience awareness and keeping their attention, really. Yeah, I agree. And it's there. there is definitely a level you can reach where it is, it is so um, grammatically perfect, so meticulous that it doesn't sound like a human anymore. And, and, and I think there is a point where we as humans will always unconsciously or otherwise disengage when we think that what's being written has, has been written by something that is not human. Um, and I, I don't, I don't think our writing should be perfect. Um, I think there should always be something in there that engages us, um, in some way. As, as human beings. So 
grammar is uh, grammar is important, but one thing I always keep in mind, I guess, for me is that um, English didn't even really have a functional grammar for a very long time. Shakespeare managed to write most of his works before anybody really started thinking about writing formal English grammars. Um, and even when they did, and even today, a lot of those rules come to us through Latin, uh, which which isn't really applicable. So there's been a lot of great writing that's taken place in English without English actually having a functional formal grammar. Um, and I always try to keep that in mind because it just reminds me that you can do an enormous amount with just the music of the language uh, before you start thinking about whether or not it's following the rules. Mm -hmm. And for managers, this is super important when you're considering writing documents that are external, when you are writing to customers, when you're writing to clients and you need to engage them in your writing. If you can't engage them, it doesn't matter how beautiful your grammar is. They're not going to read it and they're not going to do what you want. Yeah, I agree. And, and this idea of the external audience is, is really important. One of the things that, that I think people don't uh, consider often enough when, when they're thinking about writing is that readers, uh, whether it be customers or potential customers or prospects, people judge you um, based on, on your writing. And you might not think they do. And I, I know a lot of business people think that that's not important. The important part is that you just you get them the technical materials, uh, you know, put a bunch of numbers in there, get the technical language in there. They'll know what you're talking about. And this idea of pushing that responsibility onto the reader to extrapolate what it is that your message is, uh, I think is one of the most egregious things that we can do uh, as writers to, to, to force that responsibility of understanding what it is that we mean onto the reader instead of being explicit uh, with our meaning, instead of being engaging with our meaning, because our readers judge us. Um, they, and we know this, anybody who does any voice of the customer work knows that customers, maybe not all of them, but there will always be a large proportion of them that will look at your writing and say, if I can't trust you to be clear with this, with the small things, I don't know why you think I should trust you to be effective and efficient with the larger things either. So before I drop six figures on, on whatever technical solution that you're proposing I buy, I'd like to know that you can dedicate more attention to that than you do to your grammar. Right. It's also a little unfair, right? It's asking a reader to think what we want them to think, and we've never told them what we want them to think. Like, read our minds. My husband thinks that it's unfair when I do that. So it's probably unfair when others do that to their customers in their writing. Yes. it's it's. Uh, but it's but it's an easy thing to do. And, and uh, I think because I've, I've spent a lot of time working in, in different areas, um, there's always this sense of, it, it, sort of, I guess it goes sort of hand in hand with the other thing that, I, that, that bothers me, some of the, the advice that bothers me most uh, in writing is when, it, when people say it needs to be as short as possible, right? Because people don't like to read. So make it as short as possible, put it in bullets. Uh, that's, that's what they want. And then th the problem that comes up with that is that they start taking out things very, very important contextual pieces of information that are pretty critical to delivering the, the meaning of the sentence, the meaning of the writing. And so you end up with it being shorter, but what you also get is a piece of writing, again, that delivers the, the fundamental nuts and bolts of what it is we're trying to convey, but pushes the responsibility for figuring out what that means onto the reader. So yeah, they're reading something that's shorter, but it's actually a, a much more uh, it's it's much more onerous for them to read something that that sort because we've taken out all of the context that they would need if we had not necessarily just made it longer but given them the information they need and created it in in a compelling way that helps them to see right from the beginning that this has the information that they need people will read that uh, it's it's not that they don't like reading I think is that they don't like wasting their time reading something that they don't need to be reading at all but they don't the solution for that isn't to cut out all of the stuff that they need to know and then let them figure it out on their own and i think that's a solution that a lot of 
of people take with their writing to sort of to check that box to say it's short it's snappy let's get it out there and and the readers will read it so once it checks that box for sure but i think it's one of the things that structurally undermines the writing uh, that we're trying to do in the message that we're trying to convey we don't end up getting the reader to do what we want anyway so what was the point of it being short and and it ends up being a mystery, right? You you don't always know if you're not giving them the information to do what it is that they need to do. You don't entirely know what it is they're going to do. Um, it becomes an, an uncontrolled and open ended process that you created by not really narrowing down what it is that they're supposed to do. They start extrapolating it, uh, and then you don't know what they're going to do. And then you can end up in some very funny places um, when you haven't given customers the path to success, just the general direction. And I think that's where a lot of writing falls down. I think that also connects with what you wrote in your blog, which, by the way, you can find at drgrahamfreeman.com if you're interested in it. It's very cool. Where you said that technical documents are now sales enablement material. Is that sort of what you meant by that? I think so. It's, you know, there was a time a long time ago where a technical document, a technical manual or an instruction manual was something that came with the product. You buy the products and, and you get information about how to set it up and, um, and, then, and then off you go. But things are very different now. You can, on most websites, you can download technical documentation before you've purchased anything. You can go onto the Apple website and download uh, instruction manuals for setting up your phone and, and uh, for setting up your laptop and all sorts of things. And people typically do that now. So people see technical documents much earlier in the customer journey than they used to. It used to be a post-purchase um, a, a post purchase kind of document, uh, technical manuals and instruction manuals and that sort of thing. But they're not anymore. It's, it's one of the early stages of, of sort of the consideration stage when people are shopping around for a solution or a product, uh, they'll look at technical manuals already. So what we think of as a post or used to think of, I guess, as a, as a post-purchase document is now a much earlier pre-purchase document, which means we need to write not just for the people who have purchased, but for the people who are going to purchase. And one of the things that they will look at is how difficult is it going to be to use this this product, to use this service, to um, install this software? Because if the instruct, if the way, if the the clarity of the instruction manual is any indication, if the confidence I get about the ease of the solution derives from the complexity or the clarity of the technical document that I have, that impacts my decision purchase. I. If I, if I look at a, at a technical document, and I've, I've certainly done this, I've been interested in a product and gone to the website and downloaded the technical document and been able to make no sense of it. And that's led me to the conclusion that this is an unusually complex product that I don't want to deal with and I don't purchase. We don't want complications in our lives. We want it to be simple. And I didn't even think about what you were saying as a pre-purchase, but you're absolutely right. It's also when we get a product and open up instructions, uh, my mom had this, the instructions were unintelligible. Mm. So she sent the product back. She's like, I don't want to deal with it. And our customers, I'm sure, feel very similarly. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. And I think that's why, that's why I say that in addition to things like case studies and technical white papers and all of these things that we normally think of as pre-purchase sales enablement content, technical documents, I think, are now pre-purchase sales enablement content. They can, they can make or break the decision between whether or not people buy. If, if people think, um, if somebody downloads the, the technical documents and says, this is my resource if there's a problem, you know, if I, if I have questions, if I can't figure something out, this is the resource I have to go to. Uh, if they anticipate that that's what they're going to have to do, and it's not a clear answer, it's not a good place to go, they won't purchase. Uh, and I know this. I've, I've done this. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, when I buy um, uh, pedals, guitar pedals, mm -hmm. 
uh, for playing music, one of the first things I'll always do is download the manual. And if the manual is a mess, if the manual is not super helpful at all in telling me how it works, I will buy it. And I think there are a lot of people out there, uh, you know, that's just something that's two or $300 at a time. If you're being asked to drop six or seven figures on a solution that, uh, that does not provide you with the, the, the help that you're looking for, uh, that I think that has a big, a big impact. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. And since we're on your blog, I want to ask you another question about it. You say in there that writers need to have humility to recognize when you haven't hit the mark and need to completely rewrite the document and try again as often as necessary. And you actually have two guidelines in there for writers that I want to discuss. The first is that you need to re-strategize when you see that you haven't met your mark as a writer. And the second one is that you need to have humility in writing. So let me ask you, how do you know when you haven't hit a mark as a writer? When do you know you have to the, rethink a document? Yeah, I think the first one, in terms of knowing when you haven't hit the mark, is really an exercise in, in being able to be objective about your writing. And I think that's really important. As writers, we really get invested in, in what it is that we're writing. We, it's, we, don't, we don't just uh, write it, we create it, right? We birth it. Um, and we, and because we're human, I think we get this, this very close relationship with it. Um, and we also, I think it can be quite bad about, um, seeing tacit information in there that isn't there because we, we, we know it should be there. Right. And I remember Steven Pinker called it the, the, the curse of expert knowledge, uh, that, you know, what this means and because you know what this means you assume that your reader should know what it means and there's a little bit of a nudge right you sort of say eh, that's not very clear but they'll know what they mean because i know what this means um, and so there's objectivity of being able to look at your writing and say if i didn't write this if i'm if i'm the customer if i'm the end user or or the, the potential purchaser wherever this is um, is this good enough for me? Like, does this answer all of my questions? And it, I think it's very difficult sometimes for writers to be able to separate them, their, themselves from the, the process of writing it in that way, to, to look at something and say, I, I didn't write, if I didn't write this, would I still think that this is good? Does this do the job? Um, I think that's a hard thing for us to do as writers is, is to, to get that kind of objectivity. It's, it's why we have editors for the most part, right? Or, or why we have uh, other people do reading for us. But sometimes that's a luxury that, that we don't always get. Um, I've worked in places where we have a team of editors and we have a workflow. I've also worked in places where it's just me uh, doing, doing all of those things and, and playing all those roles. And I think, especially when it's the latter, you need to be able to find a way of looking at your own writing and saying, this works for me because I wrote it. But if I hadn't written this, this doesn't work. This doesn't answer the question. Uh, and then you need to be able to, to go back and have a look at where it went wrong. And this is another place where I think having a systematic approach to writing can be very, very helpful because you can identify precisely where things went wrong. Um, you can say, this is, this is a problem. You can say, this is a problem with the writing. Right. This is just this is this is the the writing part. This is a grammar thing. This is a a flow thing or a, a you know a, a musical element of the writing. This is the problem. Or you can go back and say this information is wrong. Um, I've I've misunderstood where this is. This is part of the uh, this is a research problem. Right. That information is I I don't sufficiently understand uh, that thing that I'm supposed to be writing about to the extent that I can write about it. So this was a research problem. I need to go back to this point um, in the workflow and figure out precisely where this went wrong. So I think that objectivity uh, and having a systematic approach go hand in hand is, is being able to troubleshoot and identify as though the writing weren't yours and then have an approach that's so systematic that you can identify precisely where it is that you've gone wrong and go back there and restructure it. And maybe that means throwing the whole thing out and doing it again. Sometimes that's faster. Um, very often it's faster to start again than it is to fix something that's already broken. Um, the, in the, in terms of the second one, this, this sense of the humility, 
I think one of the things, and it, it ties back to the first one as well, is this idea that it's the writing that we provide is a product. Um, it's, it's not my kid, right? Like I'm not, in, I'm not invested in it. I don't want to see it grow up and go out into the world. And, and I'm not that tied to it. It's a product. Uh, it does its job or it doesn't do its job. But if, if somebody sends me feedback on the writing and tells me that it's not doing the trick, or if I've done my analysis and see that it's, it's not doing the trick, um, I didn't actually give birth to it, right? I didn't create it in, in, in the sense that I think we sometimes associate with writing. It's a product and, and we, can, we need to get, it's not just humility, it's that sense of distance. It's just that sense of saying, um, it's a product that I need to deliver. It's not doing what it, what it is that it was supposed to do. I can cut parts out of it without a problem. I'm not cutting parts out of me when I have to revise my writing heavily. Um, I'm not disfiguring my soul or my sense of self, or my artistic sensibilities. It's just a deliverable that, that I have to provide to somebody else. And I think that, that that's a really important stage to reach as a writer is to say, I need to cut this to pieces uh, for it to work. And that is not uh, a reflection on me as a writer or as a person or uh, as someone who is, is creating this. It's a product like anything else. The product team does that all the time. They fix bugs. Um, you know, the developers don't have any problem with fixing bugs. We shouldn't have problems with fixing bugs either. I think it's part of the gig. Mm -hmm. I think writers get wrapped up and when they get critique from their managers or from editors, it's like, you're critiquing my brain. And as you said, mm -hmm. you're critiquing part of me. But when managers make it clear, hey, no, this I'm critiquing the deliverable so it can be better, so we can get these bugs out. And when writers feel, okay, I'm fixing my product rather than my brain or some part of my soul, it feels better. And then the process becomes much more efficient and less miserable. We're all about making writing less miserable because <clears throat> some people don't enjoy writing like you and I do, which is understandable. So if we can make it less miserable, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and you're making your brain better when, when you fix things, right? Like uh, if I don't know anybody who writes things perfectly all the time, every time we get better by being critiqued by other people. We get better by making mistakes. So we should be excited to get feedback. Um, I mean, not all feedback is nice to get. And sometimes not every reviewer has, has uh, you know, deep, insightful things to say. But it's good to get feedback. It's important to get feedback. It's important to say, I'm going to learn something about how this should go next time. And I'm going to be, I'm going to be better for it. And I think that's really important. You know, you also said something, Graham, that was very important, and that's having a system in place. Uh, we use the word strategy, but it's essentially the same thing. When you have a system or a strategy in place, it makes writing uh, much more efficient. You're able to go back and fix certain areas in your strategy or in your system rather than not even knowing where to start, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And it, it removes, and I think that can be really important because uh, I, I, I think there's a, a sense of mystery that writing sometimes has. And I think writers sometimes cultivate that, this idea that um, we're just inspired, that we just sit down and we just write and beautiful things come out. And that's, that's the gift of being a writer. But a systematic approach means that anybody could do it. Um, you, you start at the beginning, you, you, put the system in place, you let the system play out, and then inevitably you get some kind of output when, when you come to the end. Um, I think very often one of the things we do with people who aren't writers and we want them to write is we say, well, just write. And we all just sort of say, well, don't like, you know, don't you know how to do it? It's, it's like saying, just breathe or just walk. Like, you know how to breathe and walk. But we just expect that people can write. And, and I think having a systematic approach can be a really, really good way of helping people who are not professional writers or who maybe whose, whose background isn't writers say, look, I don't know where to start. 
um, I, I don't know how to write. And, and I, I know so many people who sit down and they sit in front of the computer and they've got a, a, a document open and they say, okay, and they expect everything's just going to flow out. If you put your hands on the keys, everything's there. But it isn't really. Um, I think what's better is to say, this is my approach. I'm going to start with, and, and everybody's approach might be different, but for me, it's to say, uh, I'm going to start with some research. I'm going to go into um, Google Scholar or, or some, you know, a science database or an engineering database or, or whatever. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to uh, get 10 articles on this topic and I'm just going to read. I'm not going to do anything yet um, that involves writing. I'm just going to read and I'm going to, to start taking notes on things when I see uh, great you know, quotations or sections in, in the article that I want to use. I'm going to type them out um, into my notes. I'm going to keep a note of where I found it and, and on which page. And I'm, just, I'm going to get 10, 15 pages of just notes, just thoughts. And then once I have that, I'm going to read through those notes. I'm going to start to, to let the story tell itself. Because if you read 10 or 15 uh, articles on this topic, you'll see that they're, they are all sort of starting to tell the same story, um, just in slightly different ways. It's a, it's a little bit of sort of a, it's like there's an archetype of, of, of stories, like there's a hero's journey for, for every article that you'll read, and we're all sort of telling the same story. And you'll start to get a really good sense of that when you've written them all. So in that sense, the information will start to present itself. And then you can start to organize this and say, well, I'd actually like to put this over here and this would make a really good uh, um, introduction or this is a really nice bit to put down at the end to back up what it is that I'm trying to say. And as you go through that process, you, I think you'll find that a lot of the, the structure, the architecture, the, the way we organize this story will start to tell itself. Um, you'll start to recognize these patterns and then you can put them down. And for me, this systematic approach is a great way, not just of being able to go back and say, this is where I went wrong afterwards. It's a great way of saying, I don't ever have to get writer's block uh, or not know what it is that I'm going to write. I never get writer's block. And that's not because I'm great uh, at what I do. Maybe just or because a little. I'm super smart. Well, I mean, it would be nice, but... Um, it's not because I'm great or I'm, I'm super smart. It's because I, I know where to start. Uh, and I always start in the place that isn't writing. I start with the, the thinking and I start with the planning and I start with the architecture. And by the time it gets to writing, the story is already telling itself. So I don't have to get writer's block. And I think that's the biggest benefit for a systematic approach to writing. Yeah. So, so many readers... I'm sorry, so many writers experience writer's block if there's a way to not get it and you've given us the way to not get it. Why not yeah. use it? There's yeah. the magic potion, folks. Now, Graham, we have three questions that we always ask our guests. You ready for the three? I Yes, I will do my best. Okay. What is one thing that you wish you'd been taught about writing that would have made your professional writing life easier? I think one of the things, maybe the most important thing, is that for all I say about having a systematic approach to writing, knowing what you're doing, having a process that works, nobody other than you cares. And when you're working in an environment, when you have deliverables, when you have a boss, when you have reviewers, the only thing they care about is what comes out the end. They don't care about your process at all. And you need to make sure that that process is one that's, that's largely invisible because your process is not unto itself a deliverable. You can't go to your client. You can't go to your, your reviewer, your editor, your manager and say, I'm at this stage of the process right now. Mm -hmm. um, they really just want to see the deliverable at the end. So it needs to be an effective process. It, <clears throat> pardon me. It needs to be one that's largely invisible to everybody else because nobody really uh, wants to see you from their perspective stuck 
in your process. So pro the systematic approach that you have is one that needs to be effective and efficient and fast and largely kept to yourself and invisible because it's not unto itself deliverable. Um, I, I always think of these things as, as like battlefield processes. Um, they need to be invisible and fast and in motion all the time because you don't have time to stop and think about it. Uh, and you can't go to your leader and say, well, I'm, I'm in the middle, I'm in the process of thinking about doing it right now. So I think a, a systematic approach, one of the things that I really um, wish that I had thought about when I was much younger is making sure I have that process and that it's always going and that I'm always delivering something, right? That I can always show what it is that I'm doing and where things are and how close I am to being able to deliver it. And that I can juggle multiple processes at the same time for multiple documents that I might be writing at the same time. Um, I think that's one of the most important things that I, that I would have thought about when I was younger. I see why you're such a prolific technical writer. Um, I think in terms of being prolific, um, it's, it's just a necessity. We, we just have to do it. We're not novelists. Uh, we, we don't get the opportunity to say, I'll have something for you in another three years when I'm ready to do it. And so everybody else in the business has a process. Right. Every, all the, the, the production team, they have sprints, the marketing team, they all have the, you know, their own kind of marketing sprints. Everybody else has a process for getting through things. And because they all have to be prolific, right? They all have to deliver things constantly over and over. The sales team, uh, sales teams have their, their processes for doing things, the way they approach things. They have their talk tracks, um, the way they approach the, customers and, and clients and they have these processes we as writers need to be able to do that as well um and and so being prolific i think that's just the gig to be honest um and i think part of doing that is making sure that we have a process in exactly the same way that everybody else in the business has a process uh, and when we can do that it helps not only to keep us productive and prolific, uh, it helps to demonstrate our value to everybody else in the business. And so we also have our process. Uh, it's in this iterative process that we're doing all of the time. We're also uh, part of the team. It, it's also important what we're doing. And we're not just this weird uh, sort of artsy creative group over in the corner that's doing writing. Uh, Right. We're not the we're, weird we're kids doing, in the corner. We're not, we're not the weird kids in the corner. We also have processes, and our processes are just as rigorous uh, and valid as yours. And I think that's a really important way of demonstrating our value to the organization. Mm -hmm. I agree. The second question is, what is a writing rule or habit that we hear a lot about, but doesn't seem to serve you much in your actual writing life? The writing like you speak one is is one that I mentioned earlier um, that has always bothered me, and I, and I think I've I've gone on a little bit about why I I don't think that works very well. Um, this idea that written rhetoric and, and oral rhetoric uh, are quite different and not exclusive to one another, but. I, I, I do find that that is something that every time I hear somebody say it bothers me. Uh, and I remember hearing it a lot from when I was in school and, and people were teaching me about writing. And it's something that I never think about. And I think it's, I think it's, I think it's bad advice, to be honest. Oh, snap. There's the tea. It's bad advice. I like it. I like how it's not just bad advice. It bothers you advice. So that it's yeah. important to keep in mind. Yeah. Uh, the third one is, what is one thing that you wish people knew about writing, specifically writing in the business world? I think in the business world, especially, 
one thing that I wish people knew, especially people, uh, subject matter experts or, or leaders, is that as the writer, I need to have the most detail and the most information that I can get. One of the things that, that I think often happens is that subject matter experts will often come to me with the messaging, uh, with, with the version of the message that they want to put out. And they explicitly don't tell me everything that I should know. Maybe because they don't want me, um, you know, they, they want to maintain very tight control over the message. And, and so they don't tell me everything. They tell me what they think I need to know. But as the writer, being able to determine how I'm going to fit in information that the end user needs to know, that's, that's my job. Um, I don't just want to get uh, a bunch of, of rhetorical messages um, and, and little sort of uh, modular rhetorical bits from marketing and then just assemble those together like Lego blocks. That's, that's not really my job. My job is to take the information and present the best version of that information to the end user. So I want to know everything when I'm tasked with writing something. I want to know if there are problems um, that we shouldn't be talking about. Don't hide them from me. I want to know what they are so that I don't um, accidentally step on them or so I don't create a, a, a gap in, in the knowledge where I am unintentionally um, signifying to the end user that there's something they don't know, that I know, that they don't know. For me, the, the thing that I wish everybody knew in business writing is this idea of, I need to know, I need to know what you know. I need to know everything. I don't just want to know your version of what you think the end user should know. You tell me everything and I'll create this, this document, this piece of writing, this message. Um, but it has to be done for me from a place of knowing everything about what it is that I'm supposed to do. And then I'll decide how to incorporate that. I'll decide how to, to, to um, veer away from the things that maybe we don't want to talk about as much. But I don't just want to assemble little uh, modular bits of rhetoric that sales leaders or marketing leaders decide they want the end user to know. I want to know everything. And I think that's an important part of the writer's job. Mm -hmm. Keep your writers in the loop. Keep them in the loop. Let them, uh, don't, don't sell to your writers. And, uh, I, and maybe that's, that's uh, one of the better ways of thinking about it is we sell externally. We sell to customers. Don't sell internally. Don't sell to the people who need to be in control of the message. They're the ones who need to know everything. We need to know what's behind the curtain so that we can be in control of that process. But when leaders only give me the information they think the end user should know, they're selling to me. Um, and I don't, I think selling internally, marketing internally to people, um, I, I don't like that. I, I've always thought that that's a bad way to do things. And um, don't market to your writers. Give your trust your writers. Give them the information they need to talk to the end users, but don't market to them. That's a great way to put it. And Graham, we have one last segment that we do called Doctor's Diagnosis here, okay. where we have listeners and clients who submit their writing ailments, and then we write prescriptions for them to fix their writing ailments. So here's our writing ailment. It's from a listener. They said, I'm just starting out on my technical writing career, mostly because my work needs a technical writer and somehow that fell to me. But I'm not a writer by trade and I feel like I'm in over my head. Where do I even begin to learn how to do technical writing? So what would be your prescription for this writing ailment? The part of me that used to teach would say, take a course on technical writing. Uh, and I've had lots of students who do that. And, and um, in the classroom, I have always had a lot of students who come to me and say that they're in exactly that position. They're not writers, um, but they wrote a coherent email once and that led somebody to believe that they can write. And so now they've been tasked with doing the writing. 
So I know that really, really well. Um, the biggest part of me, though, doesn't think that's a very effective way of doing things in the short term. Maybe in the long term, that can be really helpful. I am a, a very strong advocate of the idea that you can learn to do something by um, mimicking people who do it really well um, and copying it and changing it. So one of the things I would say is if you've been tasked with doing technical writing and you need to know what it is that you're doing, I'd say find some technical documents that you like that, that have worked really well for you in your life in anything. Um, you know, if you're a software developer, but uh, you really like the instructional materials for this electric kettle that you bought at home about, you know, installation and, and, and uh, safety and that kind of thing. Use that as your template and, and create your documentation based on exactly that idea. Um, the content's obviously different, but take the structure um, and copy it, learn from it, work within it. One thing that I often have my students do um, is, is take a, a number of technical documents and uh, take 10 of them and then create um, a, a spreadsheet, a table, and put down in, in each of them what all of the different sections are until you have a spreadsheet with, with uh, 10 sort of, of columns, each of which represent a different technical document, and they can all be very, very different. Um, and then compare them and see what the main elements that they all have are. So do they, do all 10 of them have, um, uh, you know, a, a, a prerequisite section of the things that you have to have in place? Do all of them have a safety section? Make sure you're not doing any of these things or, or whatever. Um, do only a few of them maybe have some very specialized sections like a section on integration with with other products and if you do that you'll find that the vast majority of of those documents all have the same basic structure right they all have these fundamental kinds of elements they're all they all have these same plot points right these same benchmarks and then once you've established what those are that's the main framework for your technical document and you can add sections as you need to, right? So you might say, well, none of them have this particular section that I need. So for my, for my framework, for my template, I'm going to need to add this um, special section on maybe how this relates to previous versions of, of the product. Um, and you can add that. But you'll always have this framework that you've constructed yourself. And then that becomes your template that you can work with all the time. So I think if I were to say anything, I would say find some, find some documents that you really like, uh, that have worked really well for you in whatever field they happen to be. Uh, they don't all need to be, if you're working in software, they don't all need to be software documents. They could be hardware documents. They could be anything that you really like. Um, and essentially copy that structure, copy that approach. This, this idea of of um, copying, of learning by example, is a really powerful one. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's worked really, really well. Um, you don't have to go to school to be a great writer or to be a great technical writer. You can learn from the examples of other technical writers. Um, it worked very well for Shakespeare. Not as a technical, not as a technical writer, I don't think, maybe. Um, but learning from copying what others who've gone before you have done is a great way to learn, uh, especially in technical documentation. And I think people can take your systematic approach that you've laid out very smartly laid out and even do it down to smaller and smaller levels, to the sentence level, to the paragraph level, see where information is put in sentences, see the flow, as you talked about earlier, of those technical documents with regard to sentence length and structure. So we can take this systematic approach and apply it from this big world of organization structure all the way down to the little world of sentence structure. And yeah. that's a great way to fix that ailment. I agree. I worked uh, for a little while in technical writing in Dita and uh, worked with um, 
it was a combination of ditta with a writing method, with a with a constrained writing method that we had to use. Um, and it's so interesting and so fascinating to see how much you can almost automate the writing process to the extent of if you have a controlled vocabulary with which you work, if you have a template, a systematic approach to how you construct sentences, how sentences, uh, you know, what they should look like in this context, what a paragraph should look like. This, I'm a big fan of information mapping, um, this idea of the different information types of processes and procedures and, and tasks and that sort of thing. Um, all of these things can be so regulated to the point that, that they're almost automated. Um, the way you structure a sentence is constrained. The vocabulary you use is constrained. The, the way you create a paragraph is constrained. The type of paragraph you can create, which is what information mapping does, is constrained. All of these things can be so closely controlled that your writing approach becomes almost automated. And I think that in a, in a business perspective is really important because it allows you to be prolific. Um, it allows you to take on any task that, that you're con with which you're confronted um, without having to say, I don't know how to do that. So if you can regulate, constrain, and automate everything from your research method to your writing approach, to your vocabulary, to the information types that you use, to the kinds of documents you create, uh, I think that's a really, really important secret to being prolific and being successful to the point that I, I sometimes don't even think about these things um, as, as deeply as, as it, like it's not inspiration. I'm not waiting for, for the muse to inspire me and, and tell me what it is that I need to write. It's almost an automated process that happens underneath as I'm doing the work. Uh, and for me, that's the trick for being successful and it's the trick for being prolific in a, in a marketplace where being prolific and having to keep up, especially in a world where we're going to have to prove our value against AI, I think more and more frequently, um, the ability to do that and still infuse it with the human qualities of being engaging and telling interesting stories. I think that's the most important thing for us to do as writers. Mm -hmm. That is a terrific prescription, Graham. Thank you. I, I hope it's worked for me. Um, <laughs> maybe it can work for some other people as well. Now, Graham, how can people get in touch with you and learn more about your work? LinkedIn is always the best thing. Uh, I do have a website on drgrahamprim.com, but I don't, um, in, in the, the years since I created the website, I've become a big fan of, uh, of the networking abilities of, of LinkedIn. Um, better than a website in that there's, there's an instant audience as soon as you post something. So LinkedIn is always the best way. I try to post on LinkedIn fairly frequently. Um, I keep my profile up to date there. I, I love to uh, interact with, with people who might want to chat. So LinkedIn is probably the best way for people to, uh, to get in touch with me and learn about my work. Terrific. Thank you so much for joining us today, Graham. It was a pleasure having you on the podcast. A pleasure. Thank you for having me. This is Hurley Wright's Writing Docs signing off. May your week be filled with good health and good writing. <laughs>